Well, today, the 15th century of Pentecost, here again in California and Toronto. The epistle for this 15th Sunday of Pentecost is taken from St. Paul's letter Galatians chapters 5 and 6. Brethren, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be made de de desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Brethren, and if a man be overtaken by any fault, you who are spiritual, instruct such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also should be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so you shall fulfill the law of Christ. For if any man think himself to be something, whereas he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man, every one prove his own work, and so he shall have glory in himself only, and not in another. For everyone who shall bear his own burden, and let him that is instructed in the word communicate to him that instructeth him in all good things. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For that what things a man shall sow, those also shall he reap. For he that soweth in his flesh of the flesh shall also reap corruption. He that soweth in the spirit of the spirit shall reap life everlasting. And in doing good let us not fail, for in due time we shall reap not failing. Therefore, whilst we have time, let us work good to all men, but especially to those who are of the household of the faith. In the Gospel, taking that according to St. Luke, chapter 7. At that time Jesus wept, went into the city called Naim, and there went with him his disciples, and a great multitude. And when he came nigh to the city, behold, a dead man was carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow, and much people of the city were there with her. And when the word the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said to her, Weep not. And he came near and touched the bier, and they that carried it stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to thee, arise. And he that was dead sat up, and began to speak. And he delivered him to his mother, and there came a fear on them all, and they glorified God, saying, a great prophet has risen up amongst his people, and God hath visited his people. Thus are the words of today's holy gospel. The Father, Son, and Ghost, Amen. Today, the 15th Sunday of Pentecost, we're in the battlefield of this time of Pentecost, preparing for the great victory of Christ and the judgment seat of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the judgment seat is coming on the 24th Sunday after Pentecost, when God is going to come to judge the living and the dead. And a few considerations on the long-term preparation for the battle. We're now heading to one of the battles of the church right now, as of this coronavirus thing beginning a few months ago. We must recognize we're now entered into a phase of persecution of the church. And the persecution is going to get worse. All things go as they have in the past. We see communism spread itself throughout the United States. And as other countries have gone communist, so this country is also going to communism. And living out the, for the prophecy made by Trotsky back in the 1960s, when they asked him, can America, America is already going, go, going over to communism. It looks like America is going to become communist without bloodshed. And they will become communist in its laws, communist in its ways. <clears throat> we are having such success there that this revolution will be unbloody. And Trotsky said, there's no such thing as an unbloody revolution. And even in America, where we communists are being greatly successful back in the 1960s, and much more successful now, there will be a bloody transition. We're now entering that phase right now. <clears throat> with the Black Lives Matter <clears throat> tearing up things, blowing up things, killing <clears throat> women and children, <clears throat> killing people who, police officers, there's there a police officer of the day, a black police officer <clears throat> whose daughter was murdered simply because she was the daughter of a police officer. And then another woman murdered a few weeks ago because with her baby taken out of her arms and thrown on the ground and beaten to death because she said all lives matter. Statues being destroyed and torn down, not just the statues of Robert E. Lee, but the statues of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And now the next stage will be the going after the churches directly. 
At this point, they're trying to make the persecution available to everyone, which was a communist tactic used in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s in the Gulag. Their target was Catholics. However, what they did was they captured not only Catholics, but also communists and atheists, and anybody who didn't care threw them all together in the Gulag archipelago. Just like right now, the main purpose is to close out Christianity completely, to seal Christianity, to shut down what remains of Christianity in our country. And it's being done right now in a persecution, <clears throat> but this persecution is not only, though you're not persecuted just when you go to church, you're also persecuted if you try to go to a football game. And so <clears throat> the football games, the basketball games, the hockey games, <clears throat> it's illegal to go to them, just like it's illegal to go to church, so that we can say the churches are not being singled out. Very similar to recent years in, in uh, Juarez, Mexico, where the policy was that the drug dealers, and they go into a, into, a, into a convenience store or into a restaurant in which there is one target. They don't just kill the target, but kill every single person in the restaurant. So that now over 40,000 have been killed in the city of Juarez in the last few years, just in that one city. And it's become a ghost town with murder after murder after murder, and they kill them all so that one will not even know who exactly the target was. And this is the way the communists wipe people out. We're now experiencing the beginnings of a communist takeover in a visible, violent way through laws and imprisonment. The state of Ohio announced a few weeks ago that the FEMA camps are now going to be able to be used for those who, it's in their law books, that those who, who uh, may not be properly doing the quarantine. And so they may have to be set aside in the FEMA camps that have been prepared now for over 30 years. Now it's time to start implementing things. So the persecution is beginning. <clears throat> so today we consider, <clears throat> uh, the, so not so much directly the epistle and gospel, except one aspect of the gospel, <clears throat> the, the widow of Naim. We notice in this case of the gospel, there's a journey. A large group of people are leaving the city of Naim with a widow whose son is dead, and they're on a, going to a funeral. A large group of people is <clears throat> following Jesus Christ into the city because they like his miracles and believe in him as a great prophet. And the disciples and apostles are with Christ on a journey. There are lots of people moving. And we know during this movement, the St. Augustine points out to us, that there is only one person who is of interest to our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the widow. He is not at all interested in the child. The boy must not have been that great of a boy, but he was the only son of his mother. And the gospel tells us Christ felt sorry for the mother. He did not feel sorry for the boy. He was not concerned that the boy, young boy had died at a young age. But he felt compassion upon the mother. Now there are many, many people in the crowd weeping with the mother. And there are many people in his crowd following him because they believe in him. But consider this movement like unto the movement of the people in the days of Noah. Often think about Methuselah. Methuselah was the great-grandfather or the grandfather of Noah. And if you look at the dates of Methuselah, the oldest man that ever lived, he died in the year of the flood, and he was a grandfather of Noah. However, a hundred years before Methuselah died, he was in the line of promise. God came and looked upon the earth, and he saw that no one was pleasing to him, and no one had grace before him except Noah. Methuselah stood a hundred more years to live. During those hundred years, Methuselah did not help Noah in the building of the ark. Methuselah did not in any way show any interest in the ark, and he died in the year of the flood. Now, we don't know that if he died before the flood, or if he died by drowning in the flood. He died in the year of the flood, but did he also die in the drowning like the others, the oldest man on earth? Did he die by drowning, or did he die before drowning? But in any case, we know that he had not grace before God, and yet he was the grandfather of Noah. The whole world was moving, and God looked around, and Methuselah did not please God. And all the sons of men had gone over to marry the daughters of the sons of God, had gone over to marry the daughters of men, and they had lost their faith. And only Noah remained faithful, and he was working and building an ark. And God, and God was pleased with Noah, but not with the others. And therefore Noah became the salvation of the human race. And God saved the human race because of Noah. And we're in a situation now in this widow of Naim where she is walking out of the city and weeping over a dead son. Christ is not impressed. 
doesn't care about the death of the son. He does not hear or notice the weeping of the great crowd that follows with her, because after all, it's such a terrible thing for a widow to lose her only son, and everyone feels so sorry for her. So there are hundreds and hundreds traveling with a funeral. They are all weeping. They are all praying. Their prayers do not reach Jesus Christ. He has followers, and they are with him, but he has no care about them. And he says in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 2, where the people believed in him because he did wonders. The end of chapter 2 of the Gospel of St. John. And they believed in him, St. John tells us. But he put not his trust in them, for he knew what was in the heart of man. A miracle would happen. Why? Because of the widow of Naim. And today we begin the book of Tobias. We mention very often Tobias, but in the Holy Bravery, we begin to read the book of Tobias. And we note here, how does God make his decisions? Always oh, used to bother me, and, uh, you know, being a great uh, studier of history, the history of Superman used to always bother me. <laughs> because Superman, there was a nuclear bomb that actually hit California and blew it up. Which wouldn't bother me much either, I have to tell you that. But nonetheless, the, the, the nuclear bomb hit California and blew color pointing to smithereens, and several millions of people died. But they were Californians, so what does Superman care? <laughs> However, Superman was not bothered by the death of these millions of Californians. But then his girl fell into a hole in an earthquake, and Superman got upset. <laughs> and then he flew around the earth. 100 million billion miles an hour. He could not run a, uh, a, a missile, but he could go around the earth 100 million miles an hour. And then he brought back time and saved all of California because of his girl. If his girl wasn't in California, and if she wasn't in that car, there goes California, and Nevada becomes beachfront property. <laughs> but the fact is, it used to bother me, but when you look at the Holy Gospel, we see here our Lord Jesus Christ in Augustine says, Look at what our Lord, he sees all these people, like a bunch of Californians. And they are all moving and they're all running around. He's not impressed. But a widow weeps. A widow weeps and he sees into the heart of the widow and he sees this woman has loved. This woman has been a most wonderful mother. This woman has been pleasing to God all of her life. This woman bore the pain of having only one child. Back in the days before our modern age, when the greatest curse a woman could be, could have ever received, was to have no child or only one. And she was cursed, only having one child. But she remained faithful. And then her son died. And her tears cried to heaven. Our Lord Jesus Christ walked by, and there were thousands of people, but he saw that widow, and for the sake of that widow, he raised that child. And St. Augustine tells us, our Lord Jesus Christ rose thousands and thousands from the dead. Only three are recorded in the Holy Gospel. There must be something sacred about these three risings. And the second one is the one in the Gospel today about the widow of Naim. There's something very special. He saved the child because of her. His love was of her. And when he saw that child, that woman, that the great love that he had for her was to be similar to the love he has to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And the mother of sorrows, when she weeps for us, if she weeps for me, and if she weeps for you, and our Lord Jesus Christ, who has no impression, is in no way impressed with myself, no way impressed with any of us, but if my mother is weeping, he's impressed with her, and he will save the human race. So in any case, today we have a great example in the Old Testament, and that is Tobias, the very great Tobias. And Tobias is the one who is great is the father of the young Tobias. The young Tobias has many miracles happen to him. But why do they happen? Because of his father. We read about the life of his father in the beginning of the breviary today, and we'll read part of it here from chapter 1 of the book of Tobias, which is in the Holy Breviary today, in the first nocturne. Tobias of the tribe in the city of Nephtali, which is, the upper, which is in the upper parts of Galilee above Nazan, beyond the way that leadeth to the west, having in the right hand the city of Sephet. When he was made a captive in the days of Sabanazar, king of the Assyrians, even in his captivity forsook not the way of truth. 
but every day gave all he could get, could get to his brethren, his fellow captives that were of his kindred. And when he was younger than, the, than any of the tribe of Naphtali, yet did he no childish thing in his work. Moreover, when all went to golden calves, which Jeroboam, the king of Israel, had made, he alone fled the company of all, and went to Jerusalem to the temple of the Lord, and there adored the Lord God of Israel, offering faithfully all his first fruits and his tithes. So then the third year he gave all his tithes to the proselytes and the strangers. These and such like things did he observe when but a boy, according to the law of God. But when he was a man, he took a to wife, Anna, of his own tribe, and had a son by her, whom he called after his own name. And from his infancy he taught him to fear God and to abstain from all sin. And when by the captivity, by the captivity he had with his wife and his son and all his tribe was come to the city of Nineveh, when all ate of the meats of the Gentiles, he kept his soul and never was defiled with their meats. And because he was mindful of the Lord with all his heart, God gave him favor in the sight of Salmanazar, the king. And he gave him leave to go whithersoever he would, with liberty to do whatever he had a mind. He therefore went to all that were in captivity and gave them wholesome admonitions. And when he was come to, to Rajas, and that's where the Holy Gregory stops today. That Tobias, we know the great miracles of Tobias, it's a reminder. Tobias would bury the dead against the command of this king who takes Amadazar's place, and he would be in danger of being put to death. One day, tired from burying the dead, a bird would drop dung in his eyes and he would become blind. His wife would mock him and say, this is what happens to you for following your God. And Tobias was filled with a great sorrow. And on that same day, Sarah, whose seven husbands had been killed on the night of their wedding, was mocked by her own servant. And no one understood Sarah and no one understood Tobias. And Sarah wept in the land of Israel. And Tobias wept in the land of Nineveh. And the tears of Sarah and Nevaeh, uh, 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 Tobias went up to heaven. And God sent Raphael, one of the seven holy angels, who stands in his presence, in order to save Tobias and to save Sarah. And Tobias Jr. was the beneficiary of the two tears. Tobias Jr. did not weep, but Tobias Sr. did. And Sarah wept. And God brought a beautiful husband for Sarah, a wonderful wife for Tobias. He brought back the curing of the eyes so that Tobias Sr. was no longer blind. And he brought back great gifts to Tobias. And he was no longer, he would, he would be saved and brought back to great glory, who was in danger of death and left abandoned in great poverty. Well, how does it all begin? That in the time of great tribulation, God sends Raphael to Tobias. And St. Augustine tells us, consider this life of Tobias. Did it just happen that one day he became blind and God felt sorry for him? And he decided to send one of the seven holiest of all the angels in heaven to go down and take his son on a journey, drive out the devils from Sarah, and make uh, uh, to, to, to Tobias Jr., his, her, her husband, and bring her back in great glory to the great Tobias and create a beautiful and happy home? No. Why does it happen? And St. Augustine points out, because when, when Tobias was very young, when he was younger than any of the tribe of Naphtali, yet did he no childish thing in his work. Moreover, when all went to the golden calves which Jeroboam, the king of Israel, had made, he alone fled the company of all and went to Jerusalem to the temple of the Lord to offer his first fruits and tithes. What happened? To youth would not turn away from God. He was brought into captivity, and he kept God before his mind and heart. He then went back to Israel, and what happened? His king, Jeroboam, the head of the Holy Church, the grandson of Solomon, the great-grandson of David. What did Jeroboam do? Jeroboam built false temples to the gods. He ate the pagan meats. He commanded the Jews to do the same thing, and all the Jews went to eat the pagan meats, and they turned away from the true religion, and who was Jeroboam? He was the head of the Holy Church. The head of the Holy Church, the head of the true church. What did he do? He built temples to the pagan gods. 
He commanded the pagan worship to be done by the Jews. He punished those who followed the true worship, but, but the young, young Tobias would not go along with it, and he fled the company of all. Very familiar in our times. We have to not follow Pope Francis. Before that, we did not follow Pope Benedict. Before that, we did not follow Pope John Paul II. And before that, Pope Paul VI. And before that, Pope John XXIII. And why? Because they, they took their holy leadership of the church and they used it to make us go after false gods. And what we must do we do? Step was to keep away from the company of all. So he did. He kept away from the company of all and he offered his first fruits and his tithes in his young age. And then he became married. And when he married Anna, he told her, we will not live like the rest of men. And that is the way it is with the traditional Catholic family. You must not live like the rest of men. The girls must not dress as the rest of them. They must not watch the TV like the rest of them do. They must not be involved in all the great video games that are demonic and that destroy the mind and soul besides wasting lots of time. We must not be as the rest of men. And they were just, and Tobias was despised because of this. But then he had a son whom he called by his own name, and he taught him, Fear the Lord. Do not commit sin. When your children remember you as fathers, as parents. Do they remember you as ones who said, Father, fear the Lord. My father taught me, stay away from sin. Is that what we remember from our fathers? What do we remember from our fathers? The father is a father of the Catholic family must tell his children and do the same. You must fear the Lord. Fear the Lord and let your life be lived under the eyes of God. And let your life be lived in such a way that you know that he's always watching you. And live in a way please dress. Don't act. Don't speak like the rest of men. And this is what must be done. And Tobias did these things. And then what happened? He was captured again. And he was sent into captivity far away from Israel. And he was sent to Nineveh, the same time where Jonah would do his preaching. And in Nineveh, what happened? There were two kinds of people in Nineveh. There were Jews who were captives with him. And there were the pagans, other men. And he became blind. But he said to his son, I may be blind. And I may no longer have any means of sustenance. And you must marry First, you won't marry a pagan girl because you are of the true religion. Second, the life of God, therefore you will not marry them. I will find someone to send you back to Israel. And there find a girl who is of God. Find a girl who is not of sin. And this girl you should marry. The angel Raphael came from heaven. And a girl of the true faith who is of God. And they, even there, they have all abandoned God. But there will be some girl there that does not abandon God. And Sarah was that and she had seven husbands, and each husband was killed on the night of the mass. They were not for her, and they were not of God, and she was of God. Therefore, their, eight, their husbands, seven of them, were killed the night of the marriage. And now she could not marry again. The Raphael and brought it happened. It happened when the Jews were unfaithful. It happened when the church of Israel was in its most weak and terrible state. So likewise, in our age of the wickedness of the post vatican II world, and the wickedness of the world turning more and more away from God every day, there can still be beautiful marriages. There can still be unions in Christ. There can still be great love and great peace between a man and a wife. And they can still raise a Catholic family in the midst of all this terrible world. It's still possible to raise men, young boys and young girls, that fear God and want to stay away from sin. And that is what Tobias did. And his wife only went wrong, only because she had to, but she did not understand. Tobias alone stood strong, and God gave the blessings to Anna because of Tobias, and God gave the blessings to Tobias Jr. because of Tobias, and God blessed the Jewish people of that time because of Tobias. When he sees one soul that truly loves him with all his, all his heart, it is the best thing to move the heart of God, and it is the best way to defeat Satan. Remember 150 years ago, when Satan said, if there were two more like John Vianney, Two more with his heart, two more with his faith, two more with his love and his way, the kingdom of Satan would be destroyed on earth. There was only one like him in the days of Noah, and Noah was that man. God saved the whole human race through Noah, and he saved the animals through Noah, and he saved the whole world and purified it through Noah. And so likewise he saved through Tobias. We must have some Tobiases in our time. There can be Tobiases, little Tobiases in our times. It's very important. 
Jeroboam tries to bring the Jews away from God, so our Pope tries to bring the Catholics away from God. Times have not changed. There's nothing new under the sun. But what is it that must be done? Therefore, the Lord of God of Israel, he offered faithfully all his first fruits and his tithes. We must remember in our crisis, we're coming more and more in a time of difficulty. Make sure your first fruits, make sure that our first fruits and our tithes are given first to God. Don't forget about the very first murder that happened. It was a priest that murdered a priest. And why did Cain, the priest, murder Abel, the priest? He was jealous and envious of Abel's sacrifice. Where did Cain's problems begin? The very simple. Cain stopped offering the first fruits of his crops to God. That's where all his troubles began. And so it is with us. If we offer our first fruits, we must give of our best to God, give of our best to the poor, give of our best to charity, and that which is left over, we give to those that are friends and to our family. But this spirit is no longer in our church. When this spirit is in souls, what happens? We shall have blessings. It's read over and over again in the bravery. The words of, of, of Tobias to his son. Son, if thou shalt seek God, thou shalt have the greatest good fruits. If thou shalt seek God, thou shalt have the greatest good fruits. It's said over and over again in the Holy Breviary, those wise words of Tobias to his son Tobias. It's still the answer today, and the times have not changed. You must remember that also, and when, they, and when the Jews went to the false meats, like today, the false meats, the pagans, that's the new mass, and the false worship. We don't go to that, and we don't approve of that, and we stay away from the company of all that. And we remain faithful to the true mass and the true faith. So abstain from the false meats. And the Jews have gone to the false meats. And now the Catholics have gone to the false meats. And we must not have anything to do with the false meats. We have to persevere in the holy truth. And God will bless us and bring a great victory. In any case, well, we persevere in the faith, follow the example of Tobias. Follow the great example of Tobias. When God looks down on our age, he's looking for victim souls. He looks at the world with seven billion people in it. Which of them know him? Love him above all things. Which of them give their first fruits to the poor? Religion pure and undefiled is to take care of the widow and the orphans. Which of them follow the way of Christ? These are the ones he looks to. These are the ones he listens. These are the ones he waits for. And when there are those of these souls that know and love him, there will be many great blessings coming to our age. And the chastisement which we are now experiencing, why is it being experienced? An old Polish priest told me, an 80-something-year-old priest, now 80 years old, an exorcist, born in America, Polish, but living now in Poland. He said, we are now experiencing this great chastisement, and there is pain and more pain to come. There is sorrow and more sorrow to come. But is our God punishing us because he's angry? Is our God bringing down his wrath if you look more closely, you will discover that this is not the way of our God. It's rather like a woman that is going to cook a great feast. She pulls up the old pots and pans and discovers there's all kinds of black filth in the bottom of the pan. And what does she do? She takes out a, a wire brush and she scrubs most violently that pot. Why does she scrub it? That it might be clean. And why does she clean it? That she might make a feast. And so let us look upon this chastisement that's coming upon us, said the 80-something-year-old priest a few years ago to me. Let us look upon this chastisement coming at a great feast. It's God preparing the saints. We look at the world around us and we see we are worthy of punishment. And indeed we are. And the wrath of God seems to be coming down upon us. But if now his kitchen, so that he can make a wonderful feast of saints. And so he can lay the foundation for the great victory of his mother, when she will bring about a great victory over Satan, he's forming Tobias's. He's forming David's. David did not know he would be a great king. He had no plans to be a great king. He just loved his sheep, and he liked to sing. And when for his sheep he sang, and he played the harp, and he played the lyre, and he, and he sang and he sang. And a, a lion came to kill his sheep, and with his great heart he killed the lion. And a bear came and captured one of his sheep in the mouth. And he pulled the sheep out of the mouth of the bear and saved the sheep and drove the bear away. And then one day God said, it's you that I want to be king. 
How did David prepare to be king? As a little child, he knew his grandmother, who was Rahab, grandmother Rahab, his grandmother, who was Ruth. These wonderful women that filled his heart. Ruth and Rahab filled his heart, and David would sing about Ruth and how she in the field, and since she left her own gods, she was not a Jew, and she became one afterwards. Thy people are my people, and thy God is my God, and the unknown she went into. And Rahab boldly commanded God, You will save me and save all those in my house. And the spirit of Rahab and the spirit of Ruth entered into David. Ruth and her beauty, Rahab and her strength, and it entered into the heart of David. And he became a great king because he could sing about Ruth and Rahab, because he could take care of a few sheep. And Tobias had the angel sent down from heaven because he loved God and feared God, though he was in captivity three different times, though he was put in great difficulty because of his own, his own king, who was supposed to be a representative of God, wanted to take him away from God, but he would not be driven from him. Therefore, he the truth, and he told his son, walk in the way of the truth, stay in the way of the truth, and you'll always walk in the way of the truth, and God will give us great gifts. Hearts that know and love and serve him, that aren't going to turn away from the truth in order to get comfort of a mass more often, or the comfort of what the modern world has to offer, which fleeting is taken away so easily and so quickly. The comfort we receive, no man can take from us. The Lord Jesus Christ said to his apostles, I, the joy I give to you, no man can take from you, and no man can, and no man will. So let's follow an example by this great old man. His youth began to be wise, who saw most beautifully as a child, so that when his eyes were taken from him, when he was not able to guide him anymore. And let's follow the great wisdom of Tobias, and the great wisdom of, da of David, the young David, and then God will bless us when the time of battle comes. Because of all, in the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost.